Last week we talked about uh, pH curves, titration curves for strong acids and bases. And um, we left this one to kind of refresh our memory. Actually, we just ran out of time, but it sounds good. Um, so here we're looking at a strong acid base titration curve. We got 50 milliliter sample of 0.2 molar sodium hydroxide that we're titrating with nitric acid. And we are asked to find the pH after the addition of 60 milliliters of the nitric acid. So anytime we have a titration um, where we, we're adding something, we need to do the stoichiometry table first. So here we have, um, we are adding nitric acid. Nitric acid is a strong acid, so we can ignore the nitrate part. So we're adding H plus from the nitric acid to the hydroxide that is in the sodium hydroxide. And we want to look at moles initial, the change, and moles after. Really, millimoles. Okay, so we have 50 milliliters of 0.2 molar. So, quick review here 50 milliliters times 0 0.22 moles per liter. We can think of this as millimoles per milliliter. And then we've got 50 times 0.2 which is 10 millimoles. So that's the amount of uh, hydroxide that is in the sample to start with. So we have 10 millimoles of that. And then we are looking at the addition of 60 milliliters of 0.2 molar nitric acid. So we're doing the same thing here. We can take milliliters times molarity gives us an answer in millimoles. So I'm not gonna write that out every time. So 60 milliliters times 0.2 molar, we've got 12 millimoles of added nitric acid. Everybody see where I'm getting that from? We have 12 millimoles of this reacting with 10 millimoles of that. We're going to look at which one is the smallest amount. That's the hydroxide. So we're assuming that this is going to react completely. So all of this is going to react. So this is minus 10 and will give us approximately zero millimoles of hydroxide. And then here, the hydrogen ion, we're also going to subtract 10, and that gives us 2 millimoles of hydrogen ion. Everybody okay with that? The little table, I think, just really helps you to see what's going on, and so at first it may feel kind of clunky, but um, it's just a really great way to get a visual on what's happening here it's very abstract. Okay, so we're trying to find the pH of this solution. We have an excess of hydrogen ion, but this is millimoles and we need the concentration so we can calculate the pH. So the concentration of the H plus will be the volume, I'm sorry, the millimoles divided by the milliliters. Moles divided by volume. So millimoles, and the volume has changed. As we started with 50 milliliters, then we added 60 milliliters of nitric acid. So two divided by 50 plus 60, the quantity. Be careful how you do that on your calculator. And this is giving me 0 0.01818, repeating. P 
pH then is the negative log of that. One point seven four zero four. Looks like we got a lot of three significant figures here. So three decimal places might be reasonable. Again, we're not going to get hung up on the precise number of significant figures, but we don't want to round off too much. So always keep more than you think. Any questions? One point seven four. They went with the two two decimal places. Okay, here's a, a conceptual question. <coughs> so here we have a strong acid in the flask, and we're titrating with a strong base in the burette. And which um, amount represents, or which plate, which letter represents the amount of base needed? So we're doing this with pictures, right? So there's no real math to do, but there's some counting, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the kind of math you do in OCHEM. So we have seven of the H pluses. How many OHs do we need? Seven, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're gonna have to go from here all seven of those. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay, on to weak acids. Um, we're going to talk about titrating a weak acid with a strong base. Um, we're not going to do weak acid with a weak base. <laughs> That's a mess. And why would you do it anyway? So we'll do weak acid with a strong base, and then we'll look at um, how a weak base with a strong acid is a very similar process. So first of all, let's calculate the volume of sodium hydroxide needed to reach the equivalence point. This is the Chem1A kind of calculation. So let's take the information here, 25.0 milliliters of this acid. It's okay if we don't recognize the name of that because that's an organic acid. But we've got 25 milliliters of that. And we're given the concentration is 0 0.100 moles per liter. And again, we can just make that millimoles per milliliter, exactly the same thing. <coughs> And then we're given the concentration of the sodium hydroxide, also 0 0.100 millimoles per milliliter. Are you starting to be okay with the millimoles? They make things a lot easier, right? No more multiplying and dividing by a thousand. Okay, so we're going to do this cal cal calculation. Um, this is stoichiometry, right? And so stoichiometry, I tell my students, always start with grams to moles to moles to grams. That's the starting place, and then you change it up as needed. So are we starting with a mass? Well, I don't see any grams in here anywhere. Right, this, this is our starting point, and that's our ending point, right? Because we have more information here. So we're starting with milliliters. Is it easy to convert milliliters into moles? It can be done, but we're going to use millimoles. So let's put a milli in there. I didn't leave much room. And a milli over here. And do we want to end up with grams? No. We want a volume. Doesn't specify, but milliliters is a good guess. So this guides the calculation. So I'm going to start with my volume of the known thing. 
So 25.0 milliliters of HCHO2. That's formic acid, if you care. And we're going to convert this to millimoles of acid. And then we're going to convert this to millimoles of sodium hydroxide. And then to milliliters of sodium hydroxide. Okay. Milliliters to millimoles to millimoles to milliliters milliliters to millimoles to millimoles to milliliters. Whenever I do that, it reminds me of Dora the Explorer. Did you guys watch that show? Yeah. And, um, you know, where do we, who do we call when we don't know which way to go? The map, right? In the map, we come out and just show everything, and then they would chant, you know, we're going to start at the spooky forest, and we're going to go through the snowy mountains and over the scary bridge, and then we'll get to the gumdrops or you know and then they would chant it because you know I guess you can't look at the map while you're moving you have to have it in your head but that's it always makes me think of that um, so then we need units to cancel right so those cancel out Let's cancel out. Let's cancel out. We looked at the map, and then we were really just copying it down here milliliters to millimoles to millimoles to milliliters, taking the previous unit and dividing by that so all the units work out, and then we go looking for numbers millimoles and milliliters of HCHO2. Well, that's this guy right here. And we were told it was 0.1 molar, which is the same as 0.1 millimoles per milliliter. And it didn't leave enough room. Oops. <coughs> millimoles to millimoles is just the stoichiometry from the balanced chemical equation. And at the end, we have milliliters and millimoles of sodium hydroxide. So we look at that, that's 0 0.1. 0 0.1 goes with millimoles, millimoles are in the denominator. So it's gonna take 25 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. And you might look at that and say, well, why did we have to do the calculation? Well, on this one, we didn't. Because the acid and base are the same strength. <coughs> but when you're doing these calculations, you generally don't know that. So this is how you do it. Um, so the volume at the equivalence point only depends on the amount, the moles of acid, not on the strength. So, meaning weak or strong acid. This calculation is exactly the same as what we did for titrating a strong acid. It doesn't matter. So, now we're going to look at um, the pH before adding anything. So this is our weak acid. Um, it's dissolved in water. It forms hydronium ions and formate ions. And we're going to make a nice table. So um, I really do like the double line that I've been adding. So that's, that's where the arrow is. So this is molarity, 
So we have 0.1 molar of the acid, essentially none of the hydronium and none of the formic acid, the conjugate base, I mean the formate. And then we put in x's for change. This is minus x plus x plus x. So this is 0.1 minus x, x and x. And hopefully this seems um, pretty routine or at least very familiar. So Ka is equal to the concentrations of the products divided by the concentrations of the reactants. And we're given what Ka is, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4. And that's going to be equal to x squared over 0.1 minus x. So you can use your solver, or we can use x is small. equals 0 0.004243. pH is the negative log of that. Let's just Any questions? This is something we learned in chapter 17, I think. Calculating the pH of a weak acid. It all ties up together and builds on itself. So here we plotted that on the graph, no volume, no sodium hydroxide added, <coughs> 2.37. Okay, now we're going to look at adding 5 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. So with weak acids now, the strong base is going to convert a stoichiometric amount of that acid into its conjugate base. We have a weak acid and its conjugate base. I mean, what, is, what, what kind of a solution is that? It's a buffer, right? There's a shortcut for buffer calculations, the henderson hasselbalch equation. But first, we have to do the stoichiometry problem. So moles initial, change, moles after. So we're adding 5 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. So this 0.5 millimoles comes from 5 milliliters times 0.1 molar. Here is our initial amount of acid, 25 milliliters times 0.1 equals 2.5. And no conjugate base. So here, what's different than a strong acid is we've got the weak acid formula here instead of just H plus. A, a strong acid ionizes completely so we don't have to worry about it, but here we've got a weak acid. So again, we're looking for the smaller one and that's going to be our change. Subtract 0.5 from both sides and then we add 0.5 over here. Okay, so this is a buffer. We have acid and conjugate base. So we can use the henderson hasselbalch equation. Whoops. pH equals pKa plus log of the base 
divided by acid. We could calculate the concentrations of these. They would both get divided by 25 plus 5, 30 milliliters. But then in this equation, they're going to cancel out, so we can skip that. If it bothers you, don't skip it. We need to know what pKa is. Well, they gave us Ka. So we need the negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4. So Ka equals 3.7447. Just keep in a couple extra digits there. Plus the log of the base, 0.5 divided by the acid. Three point one four two seven. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So to get the the K the PKA. We just take the negative log of the Ka. So that P in front of something means negative log of this thing. Great question. Anybody else? So we looked at the stoichiometry of the reaction, and then we realized we have a buffer. We don't have to do the equilibrium problem. We can use this equation. Well, what if you forget that you could use this equation? Could you solve it with the equilibrium approach? Absolutely. You're going to end up with the same answer. That's fine. So adding 10, 12 and a half, 15, 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. We see that the moles of acid are going down and the moles of weak base are going up, right? Because we're adding more sodium hydroxide, which is converting more of the acid into the conjugate base. This is kind of a special place right here. It's the half equivalence point. In the first slide of this part, we calculated that the equivalence point was going to be at 25 milliliters. This is half of the equivalence point. 12.5. At the half equivalence point, the pH of the solution will equal the pKa of that weak acid. So let's, let's see how that works. Let's just do this one real quick. <coughs> I'm just going to say we've got hydroxide plus acid going to A minus plus one. Moles initial change, moles after. So adding 12 and a half milliliters of 0.1 molar, that's 1.25 millimoles. And we started out with 25 times 0.1, which was 2.5 millimoles, and zero of that. The smaller amount is going to be the change, minus 1.25, minus 1.25, plus 1.25. Here's a slide I didn't change. So they're doing it in the book in moles. Now, what number is friendlier to write? 
1.25 or 0 0.00125. I prefer 1.25. It's just a lot easier. We don't have all those zeros hanging all over the place. So this is how they got those amounts. Those are equal, right? When those are equal, in the henderson hasselbalch equation, I got a pKa plus log of base over acid. When those are equal, this is one, and the log of one is zero. And so pH is equal to the pKa. at the half equivalence point. Any questions? These, these other pHs, we calculate the same way we did the five milliliters. Do the stoichiometry table, and then use the henderson hasselbalch equation. And then let's look at the equivalence point. So we've added <coughs> 25 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide, and we had 25 milliliters of the acid. So we start with 2.5 millimoles, added acid, 2.5 millimoles of the weak acid. And now they're the same, so we subtract, and they end up both being zero, and this ends up being 2.5 millimoles. With the strong acid, we looked at this and said, well, because this was just H+, plus, and we figured out it was neutral. But there's zero of the weak acid, but we have conjugate base, right? So now what we need to do is we need to think of this as a solution of a weak base. This is the weak base. So we're going to do an ice table for the base. So CH2O minus plus water gives us HCH2O plus hydroxide. So we're looking at that ion acting as a weak base. So we can't use the acid equivalence or equilibrium anymore. We're looking at the base. So initial change equilibrium. Well, what would this be in terms of molarity? So um, that divided by 50 milliliters, 2.5 divided by 50 milliliters is 0 0.05 molar. So initially we have 0 0.0500 moles per liter. And we have none of the weak acid and none of the hydroxide. This is the ice table. So minus x plus x plus x, 0 0.0500 0, 0 minus x, x, and x. There's a lot of writing on this page. Um, so KB is equal to the, um, the products here. Divided by the reactants. And I think Probably the most common mistake is that students um, 
fail to realize that we're not looking at a weak asset anymore, we're looking at a weak base. So can we use the KA? No, we need the KB. KB equals one times 10 to the minus 14 divided by the KA. So 5.556 5, times 10 to the minus 11. And again, I'm just keeping some extra digits. So 5.556 5, times 10 to the minus 11 equals x times x, which is x squared, divided by 0 0.0. Five zero zero minus x. Kb here is very small. You can use a solver or you can use the x is small approximation. I'm going to do x is small. What does x equal here? We're trying to find the pH. x is equal to the hydroxide ion concentration. So we could find the pOH by taking the negative log of that. So here at 25 milliliters, we've graphed 8.22. There is a big jump in pH here. This area was a buffer, and so adding more hydroxide. Hello. There we go. Phew, that was scary. Um, adding more hydroxide. Um, doesn't change the pH very much. But when we get to the equivalence point, it's not a buffer anymore. Now we have to treat it as a solution of a weak base. The equivalence point for the titration of a weak acid is always basic. For strong acids, strong base, it's seven. But when you titrate a weak acid, the pH at the equivalence point will be greater than seven. Any questions? So make sure I'm in the right place. That's the one we just did. So let's look at after the equivalence point. Well, that is the equivalence point. One more. <coughs> oh. That's why there wasn't very much room on the previous slide. This is where all the room is. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, you people who have the slides in front of you. It's okay. So after adding 30 milliliters, this is after the equivalence point. So now we have, we're doing our stoichiometry table here. We're adding hydroxide. 30 milliliters times 0.1, 3 mil, millimoles. The acid, 25 milliliters times 0.1, 2.5 millimoles. We take the smaller number, subtract from both of these, add to the other side. And here we get millimoles. No, they didn't. I just totally missed out on the shortcuts. Okay. 
So what do we do here? We have a solution of a weak base. So we need to look at a weak base. So we're going to have, um, yeah, CH2O minus. And when you put that into water, it's going to grab hydrogen because it's a base going to produce hydroxide ions. These are millimoles. And we need to convert them into molarity. So for the base, we've got 2.5 millimoles divided by the total volume 25 plus 30 so 2.5 divided by 25 plus 30 0 0.045 That's this guy right here. That's my initial molarity for my weak base. And we're, we're starting with zero acid and essentially zero hydroxide. And then we look at how this changes. So KB equals the products over the reactants, right? X squared over 0 0.04545 minus X. What is KB? It's the same as it was in the previous slide. Let's see if I can scroll back in my calculator. 5.556 times 10 to the minus 11. I'm not sure what I'm trying to write there. That's 10 to the minus 14 divided by the Ka. So we can do this in the solver, or we can use x is small. Is X the hydrogen ion concentration? No, it's the hydroxide ion concentration. Is this inconvenient? Yes, it is. It's annoying and it's tedious. I've never claimed that science isn't tedious. It can be exciting, but it's also really tedious. So we find the pOH, and the pH is 14 minus the pOH. So 14 minus 
8.2011, Well, that's not right. What did I mess up? Does anybody see what I messed up? Spare us the agony? No. Ah, I think we found it at the same time. This isn't zero. I put zero because that's what we've been doing. Again, I wish I had made this mistake on purpose. It's actually a good one. <coughs> Very common one. Hence, I did it. This is not zero because there's excess base. So that, that changes things a little bit. So this is 0 0.50 millimoles. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That would have just been really ugly. I'm like, wait a minute, how is that so big? We have to find the molarity first because we don't want millimoles. So this is going to be 0.5 divided by 55. Are you lost yet? I am almost lost. Point zero zero nine zero. So this is x times point zero zero nine zero come on plus x. So this is just wrong. So I'm going to do x is small on this. That's going to be 5.556 times 10 to the minus 11 times 0 0.04. I get x is equal to 2.7795 times 10 to the minus 10. We should check that by dividing it by the smallest thing that x was added to or subtracted from. I bet a lot of money that that's going to be less than 1%. Okay, how do we find the hydroxide ion concentration? Hydroxide ion concentration is that number plus x. But we just said that x was small. But let's, let's do the math anyway. 0 0.009090 plus 2.7795 times 10 to the minus 10 is just still. Well, actually, 
actually, let's just get that real quick. So the hydroxide ion concentration is equal to 0 0.009090 plus x. And x was small. So just like throwing an extra peach on the semi-truck doesn't affect it. So pH will be 14 minus the pOH. pOH is negative log of that 0 0.009090. 2.0414 11 point <coughs> I'm just going to round it 96 Okay, that matches up with the graph a little better, doesn't it? Cuz my my previous answer um was actually a little smaller than the pH at the equivalence point, which does not make any sense at all. We added more base, the pH should go up. That's a complicated problem, isn't it? There's a lot of steps in there. If you can think about what's happening, if you understand the individual pieces, putting them together is not that bad. It's still kind of bad, but it's not that bad. If you're iffy on ice tables or stoichiometry tables, or how to find pH from hydroxide ion concentration, it's going to be really tough. Okay, so if you're missing some of these basics, please come and ask me about them. It is actually a lot faster than going back through and watching the videos and or looking online or asking your neighbor. So. I cannot know, each of you has your own little brain glitches, right? Things that just didn't quite make sense. And I can't know what they all are. But if I talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, then I can find it out and I can fix it for you. And then things get much easier. So talk to me. So any questions? We're going to do the same process for the rest of these. Does anybody want to see that whole awful process again? I mean, I will do it, but I don't think anybody wants to see it. I don't want to do it. It's a lot. How about this? We'll talk through the steps. So the first thing is you're going to make that stoichiometry table. So you can, you're looking at the millimoles of hydroxide, the millimoles of acid, and you're finding out how they would completely react. Then convert the millimoles to molarity. Actually, let's say it this way. Divide millimoles from that table by total volume. And that will get you the molarity of those things. Now, you're going to make a nice table. And I resisted the urge to write ice, ice, baby. You're going to make a nice table. And in that ice table, X is not going to mean, it's not going to represent anything especially useful. The hydroxide concentration will be um, the initial hydroxide plus X. So you do that table. You subtract x's, you add x's, and um, x is going to be, well, x is going to be small, for one thing. 
but X is actually going to be the weak acid that gets reformed. <coughs> and so then, um, find the pOH and then find the pH. You need to practice that. There will be a question like this on the next exam. So here's the overall pH curve. Um, initial pH is just a solution of a weak acid, calculating the pH solution of a weak acid. Here, before the equivalence point, this is the buffer range, and you can use the henderson hasselbalch equation. At the equivalence point, you have a solution of the weak conjugate base. And so you use that to calculate the pH. After we have hydroxide ion in excess, and so we have to do an ice table. Questions? It's a lot. It's a lot. Oh, goody. An example to do. 40 milliliter sample of nitrous acid, 0.1 molar, titrated with 0.2 molar KOH. Oh, they gave us different molarities, so that'll make things a little interesting. <coughs> Calculate the pH at the equivalence point. Oh, good. They didn't ask us about after the equivalence point. So we've added something. We need to look at stoichiometry. So we've got hydroxide that is being added to our weak acid. And we're going to assume that that reacts completely. That's going to give us NO2 minus and H2O. moles initial, right? So what are we adding? Um, we have 0.2 molar KOH. Oh, it doesn't tell us how much we're adding. Nice. Let's look at the stoichiometry of the reaction between the acid and the base. Here's our acid reacting with the hydroxide. It's going to neutralize the hydroxide. And so we've got 40 milliliters of the nitrous acid, 0.1 molar, and we have 0.2 molar hydroxide. And we want to know how many milliliters. So we start with grams to moles to moles to grams, and then we kind of edit that into milliliters to millimoles to millimoles to milliliters. Do not use the dilution equation. Forty milliliters. HNO2, and we're going to convert that to millimoles of HNO2. And then we're going to convert that to millimoles of hydroxide. And then we're going to convert that into milliliters of hydroxide. It's 0.1 millimoles per milliliter. It's, let's see, I forgot the HN. It's one, it's not a three, it's a two.
The stoichiometry is one to one. And then over here, so these are all canceling out. So 40 times 0.1 divided by 0.2, 20 milliliters. There, there are some shortcuts you can do here, but I don't want to do those because I think it's confusing enough without shortcuts. Okay, so we found that we needed 20 milliliters of KOH. Um, I'm going to use this as my moles initial, moles after table. Oh, actually, I need to get rid of that too. The moles initial, the volume times the molarity. So 4.00 millimoles, and we've added 20 times 0.2, which is also 4 millimoles. And we should expect this because this is at the equivalence point, right? So we've converted all of the acid into the conjugate base. We have a solution of a weak base. <coughs> so the initial base concentration is going in our ice table is going to be four millimoles divided by forty plus 20. Zero point zero six 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 seven. Okay, again, lots of steps here. This is gonna, this is our weak base. So how do we remember this? You need to understand the process and practice. And so a good way to start is sometime later today, go back to the slides and try to do these problems yourself, all by yourself. You'll probably get a little stuck. Pull up the video. Move forward and just watch a little bit until you get unstuck and then pause it again. And then finish it. Get some more help if you need to. But get through the problem doing as much of it as you can by yourself. Then try to do it again all by yourself. Maybe you want to wait till tomorrow. That's okay. Um, but don't wait too long because there's more stuff coming on Wednesday. And then you do the homework. Okay. <coughs> so in addition to nasty, long calculation problems, there will be questions like this that could show up on an exam. Um, two 25 mil samples of unknown monoprotic acids, A and B, are titrated with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide solutions. The titration curve for each acid is shown below. 
which of the two weak acids is more concentrated? So if the acid is more concentrated, what is that going to affect? Is that going to affect the pH or the volume of sodium hydroxide to get to the equivalence point? Well, it will affect the pH at the equivalence point, but we're not going to be able to, wait a minute, but it's very, it's very murky. There's not a clear relationship there. It's going to directly affect the volume needed. So here, where's the equivalence point? Well, it's in this inflection point. So here we've got a little less than 35 milliliters, and over here we've got less than 25. This required more sodium hydroxide. Is it more concentrated or less concentrated? More concentrated, because it needed more. So A is more concentrated. higher molarity. That was a weird looking R. Any questions about that? Now they're asking which of the two weak acids has the larger Ka? Well, how are these guys different aside from that this is scooted over? So this is starting with initial pH of a little less than four, and this looks like it's less than three. So is a high Ka going to give you a lower pH or a higher pH? if more of it ionizes, it's gonna give you a lower pH, right? This one has the lower initial pH. You could also look at the half equivalence point, but because these numbers are not super nice, um, it's a little bit murky. Halfway is about here, um, so it looks like that's less than five. Here, halfway, oh, that's pretty close to six. So here, the pKa is more positive. Which means, my brain just did a somersault. pKa is higher, that means that the um, Ka is lower, because it's strangely opposite. I think this is better. So this is a little less than four, um, less than three. This is um, a lower concentration. No, pause. Okay, so scratch that, bad idea. Um, looking at the initial pH would be fine if the concentrations were equal. Are the concentrations equal? No, they're not. So the initial pH depends on the Ka, it also depends on the concentration, and that's why I'm getting confused because my two things are giving me opposite answers. <coughs> so if we just eyeball, um, that as the midpoint of our titration. At the midpoint, the pH equals the pKa. So which one has the larger pKa?
not going well. This is a good Monday, but sure. PKA is the negative log of the K. We have a negative sign in there, we have logs in there. And so this, this one is larger PKA, but how does that translate to the KA? So let's just say, let's look at, well, what's the negative log of 0 0.1? And what's the negative log of 0 0.001? So this is going to be 1, and this is going to be 3. The higher pKa is the smaller Ka. So then I need to take back what I took back. <laughs> So larger Ka will be the smaller pKa. So that'll be this guy. Oh, I didn't put the answers on there. That is just... So I'm going to go with this little test that I did for myself. Um, the smaller pKa is the larger Ka. So B is the larger Ka. That was horrible. My apologies. I might actually take the time to go cut that out. Okay. <coughs> what about titrating a weak base with a strong acid? Similar to the weak base with the strong acid. I mean, weak acid with a strong base. Now I'm all confused. But the, the curve is going to start high and go low. Um, again, we'll see an, an inflection point here at the equivalence point. Up here is the buffer region for the base. And down here, we have an excess of acid. This is a little tricky. When you're calculating pH in the buffer region, you need to use pKa for the conjugate acid of the base being titrated. henderson hasselbalch equation is always Ka. What's the pH at the half equivalence point in the titration of a weak base with a strong acid the KB, PKB of the weak base is 8.75. So the half equivalence point means that the base and acid concentrations are equal because we've titrated half of the base. And so this whole thing goes to zero. So the pH is going to equal the pKa, but they gave us pKb. Is the answer 8.75? No, it's 14 minus 8.75. So 5.25. OK, 
Okay, we're not getting past this section today. We're just going to finish this one. <coughs> Titration of a polyprotic acid. So here we have um, H2SO3. It's got two hydrogen ions. So as we're titrating it, um, the, first, the first hydrogen ion has this Ka, and the second one has this Ka. If those are significantly different, we will see two inflection points. But if they're close together, we'll just kind of see a murky business. The volume needed to reach the first equivalence point will be equal to the volume needed to reach the second equal equivalence point. Consider these three titrations. So in each of these, we're titrating 25 milliliters of a 0.1 molar acid with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. <coughs> the difference is we have a monoprotic weak acid, we have a diprotic weak acid, and we have a strong acid. Which statement is most likely to be true? All three titrations have the same initial pH. Is that true? No, because these, are, these acids are different. A strong acid and a weak acid are going to have a different pH. All three titrations have the same pH at their first equivalence points. No, for, for a strong acid, it's 7. And for a weak acid, it's going to be above that. All three titrations require the same amount of sodium hydroxide to reach their first equivalence points. That's the one that's true. Monoprotic acid, strong acid, the diprotic acid, to titrate it completely would need twice as much, but they're saying just to get to the first equivalence point. So you did a lot of titrations in Chem 1A, and we used an indicator called phenolphthalein. <coughs> we do that because it's, um, it's quick and easy. So we can monitor the titration with an indicator or with a pH meter. If you don't have a pH meter, you use, just use an indicator. So with the indicator, we're looking at the point where the indicator changes color. So the point where the indicator changes color is the end point, which hopefully is the same as the equivalence point, but it could be a little different. If we choose the correct indicator, the end point will occur at the equivalence point. <coughs> so what we see here is we've got no color from the indicator, and here it's beginning to change. And if we go on, more of it's going to change. Because the indicator is itself a weak acid or a weak base. So indicators are typically weak organic acids that have different colors than their conjugate bases. And because these colors are very intense, you only need a little tiny bit. We were putting in like two or three drops of 0.1% indicator. So really, really small amount. You don't want a whole bunch of it in there because then that's going to affect your titration because you'll also be titrating the indicator. This is, um, that's the structure for phenolphthalein, right? And you thought the name was bad. Um, and so it will take on, um, it can act as an acid losing its hydroxides and then it, I mean, losing its hydrogen ions and then it will turn pink. If we put hydrogens back on, it goes back to colorless. <coughs> so um, indicators are going to change color within a range of two pH units centered at the pKa of that indicator. So when the pH of the solution is equal to the pKa of the indicator, then you get your intermediate color. 
Um, when it's one pH unit above, you're going to get the color of the weak base and below the color of the acidic form. So this is an example of the color change for methyl red. So here we've got red and red and yellow, and this is kind of an orangish yellow. And I would guess that it's um, pKa is about seven. So it looks like this is where the color is changing. So there are lots of acid base indicators. Phenolphthalein changes color um, around nine. And you might think, well, that's really high. But when you're using a weak acid, the equivalence point will be like eight or nine pH. So this is a good one for titrating um, weak bases. I mean, sorry, weak acids. And then we got all these other guys in here. This one actually is diprotic, and so it has two color changes, which could be useful. And thymol blue also does that. 